oscillators. The main types are RC relaxation oscillators, phase shift oscillators, YN bridge and twin T oscillators, which are technically different, but they're using the same concept, so they're lumped together. Um, LC oscillators and crystal oscillators. Basically, an oscillator requires that there is some kind of positive feedback and a closed loop gain of greater than one. That basically means your uh, losses of the, R of the LC tank circuit or your phase shifting network or whatever uh, has to be overcome by the gain of the amplifier. And positive feedback basically just means the signal being fed back has to be in phase with the input. In other words, it can't be negative feedback where it degenerates the, the signal, has to regenerate the signal, uh, and that's what causes the oscillation. That's what causes a repeating pattern, if you will. Um, probably the most simple is what's called the rel RC relaxation oscillator, which basically is where you have a capacitor being charged up and once it reaches a certain threshold, it discharges. The circuit changes states and uh, drains the capacitor the exact same way. And when it hits the negative voltage of that threshold, it does the same thing. It stops, turns around, and charges back up. Uh, this can be implemented in a few different ways, but probably the simplest is with an op amp right here. Um, basically, there's voltage divider network set up so that you get a threshold voltage set by these two resistors and the frequency is determined by this capacitance and this uh, resistance here like that time constant will determine uh, this period and hence you can know the frequency now that red waveform there, that triangle wave thing, that is the voltage on the capacitor as it's charging and discharging. The op amp uh, is operating under positive feedback and so it's gonna latch back and forth during the pause. Anytime it's charging, it's gonna be railed up against the VCC or you know the positive rail or down to zero volts uh, when it's discharging. Um, I got a circuit of this here. Um, it's just a LM358 op amp, uh, just one section of it being used. It's pretty much that exact same circuit there, except there's a couple, just one or two modifications to get it to work on a single supply of, will it focus, 16 volts. And I'll show you what the waveforms are. Turn up the intensity. Basically, Right there is your waveform on your capacitor. That's that's channel one here. That's going straight to the uh, the top of that cap there. So you can see it being charged and discharged. Um, that square wave is well, you know, not quite a perfect square wave, but nonetheless, that's the output of the op amp. And another circuit that you probably see more often is probably one of these. This is something you might see in like a, an analog synthesizer where it generates a triangle wave uh, but then also a square wave. This op amp's operating under positive feedback and so any signal you send into it, it's going to be kind of like a Schmidt trigger where it'll just, you know, slam either full negative or full positive. Um, this is like an integrator and so it's like you get this constant current sort of charging and discharging the capacitor. So it's like a less kind of curved version of this. Okay, so this thing also, the frequency of this also depends on the saturation voltage of the op amp, meaning how close can this output get to the, the uh, power supply rail before it, it can't go anymore because of a uh, transistor voltage drops or whatever. Um, I went ahead and constructed this and well actually here's the circuit I added a potentiometer in there see the thing about oscillators is there's no guarantee that they'll actually work uh, for instance right now I got it working and as you can see you get the triangle wave here coming off that first op amp and off the second 
it rails out and it makes your square wave. So that's how you make a triangle wave. Now, actually, uh, in synthesizers, like analog synthesizers, they'll use these, they'll, a lot of voltage capability to it so that they can make a voltage controlled oscillator so that when you change the voltage, you get a change in frequency. Oh, see how it just went off there? By rotating this pot, like it got too low in frequency and so now it won't start, it won't oscillate. But I can crank this way up. Let's see. Uh, it's just not triggering right. Um, yeah. <laughs> it could be slew rate limiting of the op amp there. Oh yeah, that is slew rate limiting. See how that slope can't exceed, like it can't get any more straight up and down. That's what's called slew rate limiting, meaning the op amp can't increase fast enough. Like it, it, it limits its frequency basically. I'll get into that and do another video. But basically, there's some oscillators are a weird breed because they are some only work in some frequency ranges and others work well in others. And so what you basically have to do is borrow a design and then see if it works in the frequency range you want and at the voltages you want. Um, and like I said, it's not like an amplifier where you build it and you know it's going to work because you've done the math. With an oscillator, it might not work at all. Or if it does, it uh, it might not even... It might not operate at the frequency you want because of stuff like this. All right, next up we have the phase shift oscillator, which, I mean, obviously you can do this with an op amp or any kind of amplifying device, but basically it, with, a, with a transistor, you have your signal at your base being 180 degrees out of phase with, with that and with the emitter. So you feed that back into a phase shifting network um, that will shift it back 180 degrees so that the signal appearing at the collector will reinforce that at the base. And so if there's any noise or something, it'll just keep getting fed back over and over again until uh, at one frequency, mind you. So this will produce a sine wave, a clean sine wave as opposed to a square wave. and it's dependent, the frequency is dependent on the number of sections um, as well as this time constant. So I got this one here on the breadboard. I got this thing here oscillating at a fairly low frequency here. It's like at 64 some odd hertz as I calculated. That's at the collector right there. A uh, little distortion, but I, there is a bypass capacitor on this uh, emitter resistor here to get more gain. If I take that out, it doesn't start. So, yeah, I have that in there so that the oscillation will start and maintain. Now, I'm not really showing what these values are because, I mean, th I just pick some arbitrary values. These are 0.1 mic caps and 10K resistors. For all these oscillators, I'm not really showing, you know, that much detail. I'm just showing the concept because this can be applied at many, many different components. Not extreme frequencies, of course, but of course you can use it. You can experiment with it. That's the signal at the base. Yeah, that's the signal at the base. I get a bad probe here, and so it goes out. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's some clipping going on there, but after enough positive feedback, it turns itself into a sine wave with a little bit of distortion. Now, each of these RC networks, um, you find out, now technically with a capacitor, it will shift up to 90 degrees, but that's with like infinite resistance. So it's much easier to have three different 60-degree sh phase-shifting networks added together.
rather than just two capacitors because it won't give quite 180 degrees of phase shift. This doesn't work at extremely high frequencies, um, but it will work up to like moderate frequencies, like probably you know tens kilohertz, maybe hundreds of kilohertz, depending on the transistor you're using. Next up, we have the uh, YN bridge and twin T oscillator. Uh, these are so similar that they're pretty much within the same group. It's just the circuit's just a bit different. Basically, what you have here is you have your normal positive feedback loop, except you have effectively an two RC filters making a bandpass filter. You have a high pass filter and a low pass filter together, such that you get a frequency response that is peaked in the middle. So when the signal is fed back, be it started by noise or by, as long as there's energy at that resonant frequency, you get it fed back enough times to where it'll generate a sine wave because it's selective only at that frequency. Um, also with this network, the phase will be zero at that frequency, so you ensure that there's only positive feedback at, at this predetermined frequency set by the RC time constant, assuming that these are you know the same. Um, and I have a circuit, I have, I have the YN bridge oscillator set up right here. Um, nothing too special. I got a potentiometer here to control the gain to help prevent uh, clipping the sine wave, in the, even though it's pretty hard to set up here. Uh, let me actually yeah, get that off there. Um, so that's, it's oscillating at probably 160 some odd hertz right now. See, it's really hard to not get it to clip. Um, what I'm doing is I'm adjusting this gain network here. This controls how much negative feedback there is. Basically, you're limiting how much positive feedback there is. Because otherwise, you know, these op amps have a gain of like a million or so. So if it were that high, you get like a square wave. You don't want a square wave. You want a sine wave. So what this is for is to get it so that it'll just overcome the losses of this network here. And then it'll feed just enough into that input to continue the cycle and not clip the sine wave as here. So yeah, as you can see, or not see, more like, it's pretty finicky. Um, it, it dies off with just a touch. So I can get it to, to kick on there. then uh yeah oscillators are finicky i'm sure it might work at other frequencies better than this but they call it the yn bridge because it is named after well okay it's allegedly based on the uh famous wheatstone bridge which is a very old circuit except that it's frequency dependent you got capacitors on two of the legs you know instead of resistors balancing it out I, I can't really see the connection, but you know I'm sure if you played around with this enough, you can get it to look like the Wheatstone Bridge, except with capacitors. Um, on to the Twin T. Okay, um, this is a, what's called a, a Twin T oscillator, and it's a, you, as you can kind of see here, it is like almost exactly the same, except that you got. Uh, it, it arranged a little bit differently, and they call it twin T, mainly because of its shape. We have two different T's. You have a T of resistors with a capacitor, and they have two capacitors and a resistor. I'm not going to build this one up, because it's like you know pretty much the same as a YN bridge. I mean, it, you can argue that it pretty much is a bridge, but you got the same exact thing here. You got these two resistors to control the negative feedback in order to prevent clipping, but yet have enough gain to start the circuit. Um, you will actually, there's more complicated versions of these that have actual automatic gain control networks, like an extra transistor or something on the output to control, actively control this gain. So it starts up with a high gain and then to prevent clipping, it brings it back down to a manageable level without killing it. LC oscillators are, uh, better used at high frequencies. Uh, the, the ones I've discussed in the past are you know, pretty much only work up to like the kilohertz range. Um, they usually don't work very nicely up to RF. They, they might, it kind of depends on your components and the stray capacitances and all that. But LC oscillators are 
they, they, they tend to work better at RF. These, these are the things you see in like radios. And there's two types, mainly two types. Uh, there's, there's more, but they're all based on these two. You have a Hartley, I mean, these are named after people. Their Hartley is known as is, is a split inductor circuit, like this one here. This is using a JFET transistor. And it's using, this is a, an LC resonant tank circuit, or what's called a resonant tank circuit, where you have a, an inductor and a capacitor, and they resonate at a frequency, at a peak frequency, kind of like the one here, where you have a low pass and a high pass filter. It's the exact same thing, you know, just different components. And you have a tap in the middle of that inductor, and that's the feedback loop, and that's what regenerates the circuit. Um, now, its frequency is calculated as basically just the resonant frequency of this. And if you think about it, that makes sense because at all other frequencies, this signal will be shunted to ground. But at this frequency, if you apply a noise voltage here that gets amplified, that component, that Fourier component of that noise will be fed back and amplified again and again by the JFET. Oh, and this, this choke here, this RFC, that's an RF choke, that, that can be a, an inductor or a resistor. It depends on the frequency you're operating at. It really doesn't matter. The basic concept is, is really nothing more than just simply you have an amplifier with a feedback loop, and then you have a selective network to filter out the frequencies you don't want. That's all this is. Um, because the tank circuit's impedance becomes large at the frequency of interest, this frequency determined by its, its time constant, basically. Now, this is how it's done with a bipolar junction transistor. I, I showed you this first because it's a little less intuitive what's going on here. Basically, you've got the same you know, tap on the inductor there. Your feedback loop is is com still coming off the top of it, but it's just placed a little differently. And it's transformer coupled to the load. That's just a minor detail, no need to stress over that. Um, and then this is just your bias network of your transistor. I mean, that's just standard stuff. You got your bypass cap there. I think these, depending on the transistor and the stray capacitances, I think this thing will sing at like, you know, easily tens of megahertz, maybe even like, you know, 100 megahertz or so VHF basically. A coal pits oscillator is the opposite. It is a split capacitor type oscillator. So instead of splitting the inductor with a tap, you just have you know your, your fixed inductor and then you have two capacitors there. So it's like basically a voltage divider, but with capacitors. Now, again, you get the same stuff. You get the bias network here, the RF choke, which could actually be a resistor. Um, now there's two ways to tune it. Oh, and the frequency is the same way. It's the exact same concept. You can tune it with a variable inductor, like a like a like a uh, a screw slug type inductor, where you have a ferrite slug that can screw in or out, or you can have just a variable capacitor on there or a trimmer cap, just set up so you can vary this overall capacitance. A clap oscillator is like the best of both worlds, where it's, it looks a lot more like a coal pits in that it's like center tapped there. But basically this capacitor here, you know, tunes your frequency, but it makes it much less, it, it makes it less likely to drift in frequency. It's a lot more stable. This is something you'd probably want to use in like, well, I don't know, anywhere you need a stable frequency, probably like a local oscillator or something in a radio. Um, crystal oscillators, these are where you want very, very selective, very accurate, and not liable to drift oscillators. Um, these are used in clock circuits and computers, but also in radios, as you've probably seen before. And it's basically like like this Colpitz crystal oscillator here. It's a Colpitz circuit, but you just have a crystal in place of your inductor. Because a crystal can be thought of as basically an inductor in series with a capacitance, having its own resonant frequency, and then having a case capacitance. The two conductors on the outside behave like a cap anyway, in parallel with that. And then of course you got parasitic resistance and 
but its frequency response is bizarro. It's like this, because there's like two kind of resonances going on here, but this, this Q, this peak is like thousands. It's really high. And so using inverters, like digital inverters, you can make a clock signal that's just like totally locked on and it's not gonna drift hardly at all. You can get crystals that, you know, they're, they're just extremely accurate. Um, I'll show you some of these circuits on the bench. This is a Colpitts oscillator I built. Um, it's singing at uh, a pretty high frequency right now, about uh, 5.2 megahertz. Yeah, it's singing at like 5.2 megahertz, thereabouts. Um, if I just move these parts around it, it's, it's very finicky. You'll notice that about RF oscillators in general. You're really not supposed to be building this kind of thing on a breadboard, you know, with flying leads everywhere. So, I mean, look at that. It just goes crazy when you touch it. It's really supposed to be point to point on some kind of, uh, you know, ground planed surface mount board. But it illustrates the concept. It's exactly this circuit here, except these are arbitrary values. I don't know what this inductance is. I literally took a coil of wire and stuck a core of unknown value in there. So I don't know what inductance that might be. Funny thing, I used this 4.7 uh, K resistor in, uh, in place of this choke here. However, it actually didn't work. It actually worked only with the choke, uh, which is interesting. I didn't think it would make that much of a difference, but apparently you can get higher voltages from that and it enables it to uh, work better. But other than that, the biasing is like the same. Uh, but this tank circuit's just a bit different. Now, I had actually built this thing incorrectly when I was first putting it up, and <laughs> it was oscillating at all kinds of frequencies from like five to 10 megahertz. It was kind of crazy. Um, but when I built it correctly, you know, as you can see, it's a pretty clean sine wave. There's hardly any, there's no visible distortion. Let's put it that way. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, this is a Hartley oscillator, although it's not going to be oscillating at RF. Um, it's going to be oscillating pretty much at audio frequency somewhere, maybe a little bit above. This is a, a transformer, like inter, an interstage transformer of some kind. And there's a reasonably shaped waveform there, but more so with this oscillator than with any other I've noticed is that if there's any stray inductance, and as you can clearly see, all those flying leads, that's a lot of stray inductance, it will lock on to many other frequencies, not just the one, you know, intended by this tank circuit here. This is not a JFET, by the way, it looks more like this circuit actually. Um, we got the transformer here and you got it coupled over and you got, yeah. And instead of a choke, I'm using an actual resistor because, you know, don't have a choke that's, you know, five Henry's. Uh, yeah, but it works. Um, there's really no difference. Uh, or, I mean, there's a big difference, but there's no uh, a clear advantage just using a Hartley over a Culpitz other than... Um, if you can minimize the stray capacitance or the stray inductance. With this design, you definitely want to limit the stray inductance if you can, because if you don't, uh, you'll get problems. Like if I pull this capacitor out, uh, um, this capacitor right here, I assume that that is the self-resonant frequency of the transformer or something. I have no clue what that might be locking onto. Not very sinusoidal, but that seems to be the waveform it sees most often. And of course, you know, some serious, you know, <laughs> ringing going on there. So yeah, you'll encounter this kind of behavior quite often with oscillators. Um, it's just a matter of uh, kind of knowing what, uh, what you're using it for, because not every oscillator works over every frequency range. So uh, best of luck.